right. Welcome to another episode of The Great Retention. Seth, thank you so much for joining us on, on the show today. Oh, glad to be here. Thanks, John. Yeah, awesome. Well, um, uh, looking forward to diving in all things employee experience. I know that you have uh, a lot of background in this space. Um, and to kick us off, right? So, you know, for our audience, people first leaders, whether this is a CEO, CHRO, everything in between, um, wanting to, you know, elevate, you know, how we approach employee experience, engagement, retention, all of these topics, right, as we're heading into a new year. So, but give us context. Would love to learn just a little bit about your your leadership role, the work that you're doing, but also Chronosphere as an organization. Tell us a little bit about what that looks like for our audience. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I'm the the head of employee experience for Chronosphere. Chronosphere is a uh, cloud native data observability platform. Um, we are a little under 300 pl- employees at the moment, uh, spread across the globe. So we have employees across uh, the U.S. We have employees in Canada, um, all across Europe, and then actually some some team members in Australia now. Uh, we have three hub offices, which are in New York, Seattle, and uh, and Vilnius, Lithuania. But for the most part, all of our employees are remote. So we we really define ourselves as a remote first company, meaning the default mode of working for most of our team members is going to be remote in some capacity. But, you know, like I said, we have hub offices and we do offer co-working memberships because we really value that flexibility for employees and being able to choose where they work best. Got it. Got it. Okay. So global employee yeah. footprint, a uh, little under 300 employees, remote first. Yeah. And uh, and leading employee experience uh, uh, for Chronosphere. So, yeah, appreciate that context. Um, so for a global company that is remote first, tell us a little bit about the culture uh, at Chronosphere and tell us, you know, what does this mean to you as a leader? But also, you know, what does that look yeah. like at, at Chronosphere? Yeah. And let me let me actually back up and give a little bit of context about my role and what what we oversee. So. Uh, employee experience has become a sort of wide umbrella for a lot of different things. And I think depending on the company or the person, it's probably going to have some different functions that fall in there. So yeah. specifically for Chronosphere, you know, we're my team's responsible for remote experience, in-place experience, uh, engagement. So we run all of our engagement surveys, uh, internal communication so that the all hands, our company, um, you know, our intranet, our wiki, um, and then building out the playbooks that support those things and give people, you know, sort of an idea of the best practices um, so that's really, you know, along with DEI and employee resource groups, those are all the things that my team sort of is responsible for and, and supporting and managing. Um, uh, as far as, as far as culture at Chronosphere, you know, it's really interesting because, um, when I was, you know, when I was in the process of looking for a new role, what, what really drew me to Chronosphere was one, I thought they had a very progressive, um, at the time, very progressive outlook on remote first, right? I do, I know I'm pretty, the past few years have kind of just from the data I've gleaned and from a lot of the work I've done, I sort of formed the thought in my head that I think remote is going to be, um, you know, it's going to grow in the future. And I do think this will, at least hybrid will be the default mode of working for most organizations going forward in the future. I don't, I don't see us returning to a five day a work week workplace. And so I wanted to be part of an organization that prioritized that, um, you know, the fact that they were even at their size thinking about this role showed me that they valued employee experience and engagement. And that's something they wanted to, um, you know, they had a great culture in place, but that was something they were very cognizant about keeping as they scaled and as they grew. And so uh, when I started that, you know, the first thing I noticed was it was a very welcoming, inviting environment, right? I started virtually like most of our employees do, went through onboarding and, um, you know, just the, it's always funny to me, like when you start a role in person, I think it's really easy to build those relationships. You're meeting with people in person. You're typically most of the people you work with are going to be in the same office. This wasn't the case. But it never right. felt, I never felt disconnected from the first moment. You know, I think the the people team, which is the team I, I'm under, um, and just the wider organization was very good about reaching out and setting up time. And it was a very sort of welcoming environment. Um, and the one thing, you know, it was a very values-driven culture. And I'll, I'll get into values and in a lot of the work we did in that in a bit. But, you know, I think those are the things that really drew me to the company um, was just from my own philosophy and the things that I believe very strongly in it, it aligned with a lot of the things that they were doing already. So, yeah, no, that's, that's, you know, I would say most leaders I talk to, um, like max three days a week when yeah. it comes in terms of coming in the office. Right. And so, 
you know, I'd say hybrid, you know, definitely seen that more and more, but a lot of companies, especially in tech, um, yeah. you know, you, you know, because we, you know, there's efficiencies, but, you know, I know even for our team, when we do bring everyone together, that's some of the best feedback we get. So there is still yeah. that, that need for connection, Absolutely. that need to create, you know, authentic relationships, right? Um, and so one of the things you said that I want to I want to dig into a little bit yeah. further is you said, you know, even though it was a remote envi- first environment, you felt this like genuine welcoming, right? So yeah. talk to us because I feel like this is something that just a lot of organizations, leaders just it, it's just a struggle, right? It's just a challenge yeah. to be totally honest, right? So tell us a little bit about that. What does that look like? How did how how have you guys approached that? Um, any kind of examples or things that you can share when it comes to how do you create that welcoming environment in a remote first setting? Yeah, I think the first is being very thoughtful and intentional about the onboarding and how you're onboarding people. And so even just in my onboarding cohort, um, where I didn't have anybody from my own team, just getting to know people and you know the emphasis on setting up time with people outside of that. And they were very intentional and cognizant of, look, we are remote. So it is about setting up time with people as much as possible, getting to know people. Um, we also do, you know, we are remote first, but we do a pretty regular cadence of offsite. So we bring teams together. And like you said, you know, I think there's, you stated it well, there are benefits to being remote, right? You get the flexibility, you get the choice. And I think it's good for, you know, for parents and for, uh, I think it's good from a diversity standpoint, we're tapping into talent markets that maybe tech wasn't really looking at previously. Um, but that being said, you can't, it's very hard to replicate that in-person connection. When you bring people together, when you get people in a room, when you're able to brainstorm and just bounce ideas of each other, it's very hard to do that consistently in a virtual setting. And so I think for us, it's about, you know, we found a good balance in giving people that choice. So we've got options for them. They can go to the office, they can go to co-working space, they can work remotely, but we're also very cognizant about bringing teams together. And when we do bring teams together, uh, maximizing the time we get together. So being very intentional and thoughtful. Uh, and then we do a regular cadence of just social events, just getting teams together on a local scale. So whether it's in New York, whether it's Seattle, you know, San Francisco, Boston, where we have these, these pockets of employees that sort of, you know, we're seeing a larger number of populations of employees in those cities. We want to bring them together on a regular basis, just for social interaction, just to get people together. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I've said for the past couple of years, I think, remote hybrid in person all of this is going to be messy for the next few years but i think the companies that are tackling this problem now are going to have the most success and i think the companies that are heavily resistant to any mode that isn't five days a week in office i think they're going to have um some challenges with it when it comes to retaining talent and um acquiring talent yeah no i i i totally agree so with the the role of employee experience at chronosphere I mean, do you guys, are you guys so, so, so love the idea of like regional gatherings, right? Yeah. Hey, I've got pockets, I've got 10 folks here, you know, and, and it's like, you're, is that something that you facilitate as an employee experience leader? Or is that like, you're empowering them to do that? Like how, like, I know that's yeah. a tactical uh, question, but I'm no, 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 that's, that's a, that's a great point. And it is, it's part of the, you know, the overall program we built, like, we don't want to we don't want to be the gatekeepers of people getting together. Right. So it is about empowering employees, but like we are that sort of connector to it. Right. Where if, you know, we own the budget for that kind of thing. And so we're working with local team members. So we're not just deciding in a vacuum, like, Hey, we're going to have everybody go to here on this day. We're working with our stakeholders in those cities to say, well, we're pulsing people. What do you think would be a good event? Like, what are you guys interested in doing? So again, we don't want to be the gatekeepers or blockers to that, but there's got to be an overarching program of it. It can't just be sort of a free for all because you know, you've got budgets and, and costs and yeah. things like that you got to consider. But that's sort of the model we adopted where we we want to give them the tools to support. You know, it's very similar to the way we've built our employee resource group program. We want to give people the tools and support and the structure. But like, you know, it, it's I think part of the amazing thing about the culture at Chronosphere is it is a homegrown culture and we want it, we want employees to retain that. Right. It has to it has to be organic. Um, yes. I can't. It, yeah. So totally get that. But but I think it's worth noting that. You, there's a budget that's been allocated, right, yeah. for this specifically, right, and uh, and then there's pulsing. So you're actually, you know, at uh, it sounds like at some sequence, gathering feedback in terms of you know how people want to stay, con- you know, connected and so forth. And then yeah. there's a budget to do that. So so there is some intentional thought that has Absolutely. gone into 
hey, we're going to make this uh, an important part of our, yeah. our culture, right? Definitely. Um, and, and I think it goes back to, you know, I see this with, with when I talk to peers at other companies where like the whole, when you go to remote or hybrid model, you know, typically they're thinking very much about like bringing two people together for work related. So off, I guess on sites would be the word, so bringing <laughs> people together uh, to connect around work. And I think one thing that gets lost in that is a big part of culture building uh, that I've seen in this is even pre-pandemic in the office. They're just those sort of like spur of the moment. Hey, let's, let's all go out tonight. Let's go to, or let's go grab lunch or let's go out yeah. and eat. Like that's a big part of building bonds and relationship with people. So you have to, to me, you've got to find a way, whether it's remote or not to, to cr- give opportunity to have those, those social moments, those social connections be created. Um, totally agree. And, and, you know, you mentioned, uh, your during your onboarding, there is an emphasis on just spending time with folks, right? Yeah. And so, you know, I may be more willing to just do those spontaneous, uh, you know, whatever interactions if I, if I know if I've met you before. <laughs> um, yeah. And so, 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 how do you guys talk to us? So, onboarding is another challenge area that I hear yeah. very frequently, especially in a remote first environment. How have you guys approached this? It sounds like you know, um, you know, again, you know, very intentional meeting people, creating, yeah. you know, uh, a schedule of of how you're going to be introduced maybe to different departments, different roles. And so, so tell us a little bit how you guys have approached onboarding. Yeah. So one thing we do, and I think there's, you'll see this a lot with smaller tech companies, and I've done this previously, is we have uh, what's called donuts, which are these little, yeah, yeah you're familiar. Yeah. yeah some pops yeah. up in Slack. Um, I love that because whenever I start a company, that's like, that's a great way just to get to know people, to put random time on people's calendars. Um, you know, it's very easy in a remote environment to get sort of siloed in in terms of that connection with just your team, right? Because you're, you're, you know, by default, you're going to be having a lot of calls with your team. You're going to be getting to learn them. You're going to, you know, get to know your immediate stakeholders and the partners, but there's this wider part of the company that you may not have those necessarily those work touch points with. And to me, like things like donuts are a great way to get to know people that you don't have a consistent touch point with. Um, But beyond that, you know, I think it's, it's, being in a virtual environment, um, you know, it doesn't mean you're necessarily isolated. And so I think you've got your onboarding cohort you start with. And and really, to me, the best part, you know, the most important part of onboarding is those first couple of days and getting people immersed in the culture, learning the values, learning the sort of broad things that affect the company, you know, that are um, sort of across the company. And then you kind of dive more into the things that are specific to your role and your team. But, you know, just being able to set up time with people. And that, that's one of the things I emphasize with team members is like, reach out to people, set up time, throw time on the calendars. We all have each other's Google calendar. Like there's no reason you can't do that. I mean, obviously you want to be cognizant of time zones and we're, right. we're across distributed time zones. But, um, you know, I think it's just about encouraging people and letting them know, hey, this is this is part of the culture, meeting people, reaching out to people. And then conversely, encouraging team members to always welcome the new team members. And that like, we are, you know, putting it on Slack when somebody starts and everybody's kind of, it's those little sort of things that I think go a long way with welcoming people. Got it. Um, and sure. so, you know, it sounds like you and I know a lot of other tech companies, you know, heavy Slack shop, right? And yes. Donut, Donut's yes. an app that basically pairs, yep. I guess, random, random. Yeah. You know, folks together to spend whatever, 15, 20 minutes, um, just getting to know one another. And so, so, so this is something that's just part of the, like all employees are 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 part of yeah, this. It sounds like exactly. You, it's not it's not mandatory. You know what I mean. When you start, you're you're put into it, and you can obviously opt out of it. Um, but yeah, it is it is something every you know when you start that that is available. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Love the idea of just you know just connecting people outside of their own you know department yeah. and and kind of uh, you know just work zone. Um, so totally makes sense. So okay. So. Uh, you know, the other, you know, question, um, that I wanted to, I wanted to, you know, really kind of get your feedback on here, Seth is, so when it comes to employee, you know, we, you know, 2023, especially in tech, it's been, it's been a tough environment for a lot of companies, right? So we've gone through layoffs, there's been, you know, budget freezes, you name it, right? Macro conditions. Um, and, and the knee jerk reaction can be, Hey, like we're going to pull back. Employee yeah. experience sounds great when times are well, but right now we got to focus on X, right? Like that, that's, yeah. that's maybe, you know, what, uh, you know, what someone who doesn't understand the value or the ROI of employee experience. So talk to me 
and I'm 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 kind of teeing this up because I know Chronosphere is a very you know data oriented company, but talk yeah. to me about how you show the value for employee experience within the organization. How do you um you know make this a data driven strategy, you know, as you guys are moving forward? So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. We are um I wouldn't say I wouldn't say we you know we're not overly heavy with surveys but we do we do a lot of surveys. We do a biannual cadence of a larger engagement survey and then we'll do pulse surveys which are typically targeted for specific initiatives or if we want to get you know data around a certain topic that kind of thing. Uh and then we do an annual benefits survey as well where we dive deep into the benefits. But what I what I always like to remind people is um you know there's it's it we talk about Maslow's hierarchy, right? And how Maslow's hierarchy affects employee experience. When you think about that, right, there's, um, it's really easy to look at employee experience in terms of like those perks and those bells and whistles and, and the events and all of that stuff. But there's actually things that I think are more important to that, that if you're not tackling those and you're not solving for those, it doesn't matter how much you're going to have on the perk side or the event side. And, you know, that's, those are things like just are, do people feel like they're fairly compensated? Do people feel like they have agency and choice at work? Autonomy. Do they feel like they have a good relationship with their manager and their peers and they've got two-way communication with their managers? So, you know, I think if you're, to me, employee experience doesn't have to suffer because of budget constraints, right? Like there's there's things that factor into creating employee engagement, creating, creating employee satisfaction, which aren't necessarily budget driven. And I think that's where the survey comes into play, right? So we, you know, we've done a good job of sort of templatizing our engagement survey statements um, that are pretty standard, right? And those are things that are centered around your relationship with your manager. Um, are you getting regular feedback? Do you feel like your job performance is evaluated fairly? Um, do you feel like people from all backgrounds are treated fairly? So we have questions around DEI. So we have that sort of sort of templatized statements where we can look at comparison data between the engagement surveys, but then we'll, we'll you know we'll also add questions to those around things that we're just you know we're looking to explore a little bit more closely for that go around. So for example, this previous one we did in the fall, we wanted to dive in a little bit deeper on um, our meeting culture and all hands, and do people think we have a good you know um, an appropriate cadence and frequency of all hands? Do they feel like they're getting useful information from that? Um, do they feel like they're having an appropriate cadence of departmental meetings? Do they feel like they get the updates they need when they need them? Because to me, communication is a big thing. And I, I've seen this at other companies where if the communication is lacking, if people feel like their time's being wasted, that's going to adversely affect engagement more than, you know, not having uh, large events or social, you know what I mean? Like those are the right. things that are going to frustrate people and really create, um, you know, poor engagement. So I, I think we've done a good job of that and creating that sort of standard for, for what the statements are in the engagement, but then also looking at things from H1 to H2 in terms of like, what are some areas we need to dive into deeper? Yeah. Um, and I love what you said about Maslow's hierarchy. It's uh, such a, I think, a. Uh, you know, taking a step back, it's like, a, like you said, the fundamentals, right, have yeah. to be in place in order for you to build on, in order for you to get value out of some of the, we'll call it higher end, you know, yeah. uh, you know, perks or whatever they might be. Um, and, uh, and so the way that you are, I guess, ensuring that fundamentals are in place is you're, you're using that pulse, right? And so in addition to the cadence of engagement uh, feedback, you're mixing in, uh, you know, uh, I guess different questions based on yeah. any initiatives that you might be focusing on the upcoming quarter, what have you, um, makes a ton of sense. Totally, you know, totally, totally on the same page. So I appreciate you sharing that insight. Um, yeah, you know, I haven't heard it in that way, but I totally get it. So yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, so, so, so on this note of, of remote first, of kind of welcoming onboarding of, uh, making sure that, you know, the, the fundamentals are, are, are in place. Um, I know previously we talked about a remote first playbook, right? So yeah. an actual playbook yeah. that you give to people. Yeah. So um, like, tell me what this is. I don't, I've, you know, help, help me understand. Like you're giving me a guide, a manual. What are you giving yeah. me? Tell me about no, it's a great question. This is sort of evolved over time. This is kind of when I started, one of the first things I talked about with our head of people, um, in terms of the, a project that I think so, you know, it, 
throughout the pandemic, we heard all these new phrases, remote first, hybrid, all of these things, right? And I think they mean something different for each company because it's the, it's the way the company defines their policies around those things. Mm. For us, um, you know, we, we very, it's, we're very clear about remote first means remote is our default mode of working. So most of our employees would be remote, but we wanted to go beyond that, right? So we wanted to dive into like a little bit deeper on what our philosophy on remote is, what are the supporting pillars? And so we came up with four sort of philosophical pillars for how we operationalize or think of remote work. And that's flexibility, right? We want to give employees choice. We want to give them agency, autonomy, the ability to choose how, where they work best. Um, clear and consistent communication. We're remote. We're not in person. We're spread across time zones. Communication is crucial to us to keep people aligned. And not just communication, but leveraging asynchronous communication, right? We, we're we not all in the same time zones. We don't want people to have to, we don't want work-life balance to suffer. We want to be very right. cognizant of that. So how can we leverage these million and one tools for asynchronous communication in a way that's going to keep people aligned? Um, support and enablement. So it's not just enough to um, let people work flexibly remotely, you got to give them the tools to do that properly. So if they're at home, they need a home setup, right? If they, if there's somebody who just doesn't work well at home, um, you know, I saw this at previously, my old company, New York is one of those markets where most people live in smaller offices, right? Or smaller apartments, going to the office is going to be a much better work, way of working. So support and enablement pillar is really around giving people the tools for that. Uh, and then it's the third, the fourth pillar is um, that connection piece, connection and camaraderie. So finding those moments whether virtually in person to bring people together and create that connection, that culture. And so that's kind of the, the first thing we started with when we were building this playbook. So we just wanted to outline what our philosophy was, what those pillars were. And then from there, we started building out just best practices from everything from around how to maintain work-life balance, how to create these sort of guardrails around your day where you're not just constantly working and you've got that work-life harmony um, to best practices for managers, advice for managers, how to remote, you know, um, to manage a team remotely and virtually for you know, performance issues, things like that. So it's it's kind of evolved over time to this sort of all-encompassing guide of how we, not only philosophically, how we view remote work and why it's important, but also how to operationalize that and give people those best practices. And originally, my intention around it was for new hires, right? Because I thought this is going to be a great way to introduce new people to this culture. Not everybody's been in a remote first environment, especially, um, you know, a year ago or a little over a year ago when I started here. Um, these concepts are still a little bit new. So we wanted it for new hires. And then it's as I'm building it, I'm like, no, I think there's a lot here that actually apply to managers as well and helping managers manage their teams virtually and remotely. Um, and then even, you know, I've worked with some of our TA team just in terms of like being able to give snippets of that to candidates so they know what they're getting into uh, when they are going to a remote first company. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, I, I literally just last month finished so now we're even we're incorporating. We have the playbook, but we're actually built a course around it for onboarding. So employees can go take this course via their onboarding path, um, and they can learn all of these, you know, these tips, guides, best practices, philosophical points around remote working. Yeah, um, that was long winded. I apologize. No, 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 it's, it's it's great. <laughs> now I want to, you know, so like I'm going to put my more traditional hat on. And yeah. Do I think of this as an employee handbook, or is it something different? Right. Yeah. Definitely different because we have an employee handbook. And to me, employee handbook is more around, you know, the policies, really understanding the policies from an HR yeah. standpoint and just the things that affect kind of every employee. This is geared specifically towards remote working and how we view it, how we think about it, how to operationalize it, essentially. Yeah. 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 Love, love that you guys, um, you know, have have invested in this um, and how this translates through your onboarding, it chan it, yeah. you know, all the way to manager uh, training. And, um, you know, a lot of people have never managed before, you know, a team, let alone remote. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so, so I totally get it. Right. Um, and it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so, uh, you know, tip of the hat, you know, to, yeah. to you and the team at Chronosphere for, um, for, for, for putting that in place, um, you know, for, to help employees make, make this, you know, transition into the organization. Um, yeah. So love that. Um, Seth, this has been awesome. Really appreciate you just coming on the show, just being an open, open book, sharing your experiences. Um, one of the things, one of the ways that we like to, to always wrap up is, um, 
just to get a, a lesson learned or a key takeaway or something yeah. that we can share with our audience that they can maybe just go, go in and, and, you know, and, and just, you know, implement in, inside of their team or their organization. So I, I know you mentioned about Maslow's hierarchy, but what, tell, tell us, is there anything that kind of comes to mind as, uh, as we wrap up here today that uh, you can share as a takeaway? You know, I think, and this is just because this has been, I've been so close to this for the past few years now. Um, and I've seen this done, in, you know, I, I, I'm going to, what I'll say is the the best thing I could call out right now for leaders uh, is around whatever their policy is going to be around remote working, hybrid, uh, in person. You know, I think the most important thing is figuring out first what is necessary and important to your company to run your actual business. Then using the, you know, looking at the data from employees, what are employees asking for? And whatever you decide, wherever you land, um, be very resolute in what that is, because we've seen this a lot with companies where they'll come out with a policy, they backtrack, uh, and then that eventually just sort of weakens their stance in their employee eyes. So be very resolute in what it is and ensure that you're you're backing it up with data uh, and you're being very intentional and thoughtful about how you implement that. Um, because I think one thing it's easy to forget in this conversation of remote versus in-person is hybrid um, is how much this affects people's lives and how much this affects employees' lives. And, you know, I, I think that's the most important thing is you've just got to be very um you know, you're going to be honed in on what your data is telling you and why you made that decision. It can't just be decided in a vacuum. Like, I think everybody should be back in the office or I think everybody should be remote. There's got to be concrete uh, data to back up that stance. Yeah, no, I love that. And and I I know that we feel that alignment. If we can positively impact, you know, the lives of people, employees' lives, that's going to impact the business to be successful. Yeah. So, um Seth, thank you again uh, for joining us on The Great Retention. Um, so much respect for you, uh, you know, the Chronosphere as an organization and the work that you're doing and just really appreciate you sharing uh, your insights with us today. No, absolutely, John. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me.